The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten lepers approached him. Keeping their distance, they called out, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated, prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, were not ten made clean? But the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. I bring you good news in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. On the surface of the reading, it sure seems as if, you know, the reading is about nine bad guys and one good guy, right? Um, and that this whole thing is just a story about, you know, uh, people being bad and not giving thanks to God and so forth. So let's dig in a little bit because you know that's what I do. Um, and so uh, we have a continuation. Last week we talked a little bit about faith where the disciples said, increase our faith, right? Because this is, a, this is hard. And uh, forgiving people the way you ask us to forgive and, and, and not having people stumble by what we do, having our lives be such a, a witness all the time is hard, right? Um, and uh, so they asked for an increase in faith and that, that, that Jesus said to them, you have enough faith already, but the faith in you needs to continue to grow and the faith in you needs to continue to grow. And so this follows on the heels of that. And uh, so Jesus is entering a village where there's 10 lepers. Now, we get this reading in a new way because of COVID. Right? So you know that lepers had to, like more than quarantine themselves, live outside of the, the community and the local village, right? So they often lived in caves outside the town, and they had to, if anybody came um, by, they had to sort of ring a bell, ring, 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 and then shout that they were unclean, right? In order for people to know to not approach them. And if we thought six feet distance was hard, theirs was like a hundred feet, right? Um, and so um, we know more about these communicable diseases than they did, but that's what the way of life was. And so these people were living in these, in these, in these caves and Jesus happened to come by, doesn't say how they knew that maybe Jesus would have mercy on them and provide some kind of physical healing for them. Um, but they did. They, they cried out. And unlike some of the other uh, stories that we have of healings, Jesus doesn't even touch them. He gives them their Levitical obligation, meaning in the book of Leviticus, it says exactly what to do if you've been healed from leprosy. And it tells you, tells you, you have to go to the priests. And you have to present themselves. And they do these examinations to see that you actually are clean. And then they slowly do some rituals that restore you back to the community. Right? You don't just, it, it, it's, it's, it's part of, of the tradition of being a Jew. And Jesus knew that. Right? And so Jesus says to them, go do your duty and show yourselves to the priests. And as they leave to go, they evidently were cured of the leprosy. Now, 
We know that one of the ten was a Samaritan, right? And we know that Samaritans and Jews didn't always get along, didn't get along at all, and because of different beliefs about certain things, like um, the Samaritans didn't believe that you had to go to Jerusalem to, to, to do your worship and sacrifices, that you could do it um, on another, in another place, right? And several other things like that. So, G so Luke tacks on, and he was a Samaritan. Right? When he says, well, the one guy who was a Samaritan came back to Jesus, and you have to go. Well, well why the one Samaritan? For one thing, why does Luke say the one Samaritan? And the other is, what, what, is, what is it about the other nine that didn't recognize what the Samaritan did? Well, we can't give too much flack to the nine who didn't come back. Right? Because they did what they were supposed to do. They did what they were supposed to do, right? In their rituals. And, um, and, and yet the Samaritan, who would he go to? The priest wouldn't accept him as a Samaritan because he was a Gentile. Right? He wasn't a Jew according to what the Jews believed. And so you have the Samaritan sort of hanging out there with no place to go. Right? But he recognized that he's healed and he comes back to Jesus and thanks him. Like so much so that he lays at his feet and thanks him with such praise for being healed. And then Jesus says to him, Get up, your faith has made you well. What's a little different about the one who came back and gave praise, I'm not saying the other nine shouldn't have, was that, you know, um, uh, for one thing, Jesus didn't want to just be a miracle maker, right? He didn't want to be like, oh, you know, I just do these miracles and you walk away. And we all know that with high mountaintop experiences, they last for so long, and miracles, you know, you kind of live in that for a little while. Um, and, and, um, and that there's something more that Jesus is inviting us to when we hear him talk to the Samaritan. For one is that God's grace and mercy and healing in all aspects of life and wholeness belong to everyone. Right? And this is another clear example of Luke's that, you know, there were those who just weren't going to accept Jesus and then the, the ministry... Uh, of Jesus to the Gentiles was taking hold. Right? And, you know, we go back even to the Old Testament reading with some questions around um, uh, physical healing and, you know, uh, <laughs> Naaman being like, my waters are clean enough, why can't I do my own thing and go to my own waters? And, and him saying, well, do you, God didn't ask you to do that much. Just go and do what he asked you to do. Right? And he's healed when he goes to the Jordan. But he thought, what's wrong with my waters? Right? And so the important thing is to, 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 to think also about, you know, a lot of us pray for physical healing and it doesn't always happen. It doesn't. Right? And even when we are physically healed in this life, we still die at some point. Right? And, and so there's this larger piece of healing and wholeness that Jesus is inviting us into. Not to be like shiny object miracle, but to recognize the healer, the gentle healer who comes into town and changes everything by offering us healing in our souls by being the divine presence who shows us who God is and shows us who God, all about God's heart of compassion and mercy and grace. And so I'm reminded of a story of um, one time when uh, I was still living in North Dakota, but I was serving as uh, president of Province 6. And, um, and so we would have... Uh, 
meetings twice a year, and um, one was often in December in New York, and then our province meeting was meeting in, um, I think we were in Portland. Yeah, we were in Portland. And so we were staying at this college, and when I could go in the summer, Felicia would go with me, right? Because it was, I had the hotel, and I had the air, my own airfare, I just paid for her airfare, and she would come along with me, and so, but we were staying in a college, and Felicia thought that was pretty cool, right? And uh, so, uh, we went to this meeting, and then we went out for dinner one night, and we went down to uh, a nice little dinner on the water, and um, and you had to go from land to this little uh, uh, restaurant on the water, and you, you had to go down this ramp, this variegated ramp down there. And there were ducks. You could see kids giving food to the ducks and so forth. So Felicia did great. She did really well around adults. And by then, she'd been to more meetings than most of us. Um, and anyway, but there got to be a point after dinner that she was ready to kind of move around a little bit. And so she, she, uh, I went with her, took the rest of the bread from our table to go feed the ducks. And we were out there feeding the ducks. And then she, she was ram, not rambunctious, but just needed to burn a little water. She said, Mom, watch how long it takes me to run up to the top of the ramp. Count for me, right? Kids do that all the time, count. One, one thousand, two, one thousand. So I did, and she she uh, was dressed in uh, 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 flip flops and just summer clothes. And so, but when she got to the top, I didn't tell her like, don't run back down. And so she ran back down, and you can see it, right? Ba boom, she loses her momentum, falls, and that variegated metal just scrapes her bad. In fact, she still has a little, a, a big scar on her knee from that time. So I scooped her up, took her inside, cleaned her up, and you know, this community of people that I was with were just so awesome. So they went to the store and got little band-aids with, you know, Disney figures on them or whatever, and they got children's Motrin, and they got band bandages and stuff to clean it up and all that kind of stuff. The bishop who was with us carried her to the car. I mean, and this community was just great, even got her some ice cream, right? And so we were back at, at the dorm cleaning her up and got her all set up, got her Motrin, she ate her ice cream, and we were getting ready to go to sleep. And she says uh, to me as, as I was talking to her, and she goes, Mommy, can you lay your hands on me the way you do to the people we take communion to? Right? I was shocked that my daughter was that spiritual. <laughs> right? In a way, like it was like, oh my gosh, this girl gets it. Right? She gets that the band-aids took care of things and the ice cream took, took care of things and, and, you know, the cute little designs on the band-aids and, and, and people taking care of her, but she knew what else she needed. And that wasn't the last time she's asked for that, right? And it's the same thing with us, that we need to be reminded to come back to Jesus all the time. Right? Because it's easy to go, well, the doctors and nurses, blah, 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 they all know how to take care of us, right? And not to come back to Jesus for the healing, right? For, for the healing that's a deep spiritual healing. Um, for healing that's about wholeness and reconciliation and a relationship with Jesus. And you can imagine this guy, how, how thankful he was to be the outsider. Right? To be the outsider that it was also included in this healing by Jesus. And so the invitation is to be thankful. And when we're thankful and joyful about all that God has done for us and how God works in our life and how God heals us and restores us in His grace and that God's mercies are new every morning and, and even us get to experience that grace that we give praise to God for that. But not only that, we tell other people about it. Right? We keep the best secret in the world so secret, the world falls apart without it. 
because we're afraid. Well, we don't want to offend them. We don't, you know, we don't want to be on their rights or whatever, right? But you don't know how something like that's going to inspire someone. to come home to God. And so, who are the Samaritans out there that we overlook, we don't include, we, I'm not saying we personally per se, but that are overlooked, aren't included, aren't part of a community, right? Don't have a home, spiritual home to go to. Who are they? And how do we respond to them? And as you go about this week, don't forget to tell someone about all that God has done for you and about this great healer whose name is Jesus. Amen.